Um, let's uh, turn now to my colleague Matthew Goodman to uh, uh, give some comments on the presentations and the themes we heard. I, I will then ask one or two questions of the panel and we'll open it up for your uh, uh, observations and questions after that. Thanks, Mike. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming today. It's delightful to see such a, a big crowd. Um, so I'm going to start by telling a story from my own personal experience working on regional economic integration. Um, in 2011, as you know, we hosted, the United States hosted uh, the APEC uh, forum in Hawaii. And uh, we were uh, very determined to make the leaders' discussion among the 21 APEC leaders uh, as interesting as possible. So we actually uh, th dispensed with the notion of um, funny shirts and, uh, and casual settings around soft sofas, around large rooms. And we actually built a special hexagonal table, uh, hexagonal because 21 can't neatly fit, so we thought that would be a little off. Uh, beautiful Hawaiian wood table, and we, we made it a real business meeting, and we got a couple of outside speakers to come in uh, and speak, including the Energy Secretary, Mr. Uh, Dr. Chu, and uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, the head of the IMF, and, um, and uh, Fatih Barol from the uh, International Energy Agency, chief economist, and they gave presentations. There was a challenge because they wanted to do PowerPoint presentations, a couple of them, uh, Secretary Chu, among them, and we didn't want to put big screens in this room and sort of disrupt the, uh, the, the feeling. So we actually um, obtained iPads for all the leaders. Now, in 2011, this was still pretty cool to be able to put iPads in front of um, leaders and to have them uh, simultaneously move the slides so they was controlled centrally and, and the slides would move and you didn't have to touch the thing, the presentation would move along. And there was one problem, which was that if you touched the iPad and tried to use it as an iPad to uh, search the internet or something, it screwed up the whole system. <laughs> and so we had to tell President Obama to tell his uh, fellow peers um, at the beginning of the meeting, there's one rule here, which is please do not touch the iPads because, uh, because uh, it will screw up the whole system. And we were about 20 minutes into the session and one of the leaders, and I won't say which one, uh, but it was none of the countries represented up here, uh, picked up his iPad and started, and found the, um, the access to the internet and started uh, playing with it. And it screwed up the system and we had to do a quick um, audible and, and uh, fix it. So the, the lesson of that story for me is that I'm not confident that we're gonna be able to establish rules in the Asia Pacific region that everyone is going to be willing and able to follow. But, uh, Seriously, um, let me uh, just uh, comment on three things. One is TPP and, and RCEP um, and uh, my own perspective and what I heard here and, and what it made me uh, think about those two arrangements uh, or two tracks of trade negotiations in the region. Uh, secondly, uh, talk about the free trade area of the Asia Pacific and how APEC is, plays an important role in that. And then thirdly, I'll talk a little about U.S.-Japan's uh, role as all the speakers again touched on in one way or another. So, uh, first of all, I, I think that um, as most speakers indicated, I think TPP is really now the, uh, the driving force for uh, deep and comprehensive trade and investment liberalization and rulemaking in the Asia Pacific. I think most people now uh, agree with that. And I think when you look at it as an American, from an American perspective, but I actually think this applies to pretty much anyone in the region as, as they look at this, um, I think there are three big uh, objectives or three big prizes to be had from TPP. Uh, one of them is obviously the economic benefits, the growth and jobs uh, that, that are produced. And I want to just endorse something that uh, Professor Urata said in his little footnote there, which should have been a, the first slide, uh, not the footnote in, in one of his slides, about the impact and the benefit of these arrangements being uh, opening one's own market. Uh, as we all learn in trade policy, the best trade policy is unilateral disarmament and opening your markets. That's where the real bang for the buck is, um, not opening other markets, although that's nice too. But um, uh, so I think that's really the benefit for all of us is, is further market opening uh, and the jobs and growth that that will produce. Um, secondly, it is rulemaking, and I think this is a, a, an important opportunity to both uh, 
update and uphold the rules of the international trade and investment system that have served all of the members of the Asia Pacific uh, region so well. And, uh, and then thirdly, it's an important uh, opportunity to bind the countries of this uh, region or the economies of this region uh, together uh, in a way that really few other uh, arrangements can do. I think a binding legal trade agreement could have a really dramatic effect in binding, you know, particularly from a U.S. perspective, the United States into this region and really embedding us more deeply in the region, which I think is something that, that all countries want uh, from an economic perspective. Um, so there's a lot at stake here and a lot to play for, and I think TPP is um, absolutely critical for all those reasons among others from a U.S. perspective related to the imbalance, uh, rebalancing strategy. Um, Freudian slip. Um, uh, I would say about our step quickly, I, I do think, uh, somebody called it Urata Sensei perhaps again, complimentary. I do think it's complimentary. I don't think it's, it's inconsistent. Uh, it is not as broad or deep or doesn't seem to be headed that way. Um, and I think uh, it, it's not going to replace or substitute uh, for TPP. In, in the ways that I just uh, suggested TPP was going to be important. Um, I thought uh, Dr. Lim's uh, point about, uh, about uh, ASEAN being the facilitator but not really the driver of RCEP was quite interesting, and I, I, I think it's interesting for the other Northeast Asian countries, uh, countries represented here. I'd be interested in your perspectives on what uh, Japan, China, and Korea's, I saw Minister Kim earlier from the Korean Embassy, um, what uh, Korea's role might be as well in driving RCEP. So that's sort of a question. Um, and then finally on TPP, the question of Chinese participation. Again, from the beginning, TPP was envisaged, envisaged as something that would incorporate all of the members of the Asia Pacific Economic, of, of APEC, and that includes China. Uh, so I think very much it's been uh, an implicit assumption of, uh, of TPP that ultimately chi uh, China would be a part of this, uh, if not of TPP itself, because I actually think it's going to be quite difficult for most countries, uh, especially a large country like China, to actually accede to TPP uh, just because of the nature, really be for political reasons, because it's very difficult, I think, for a country like China to join a, a mega regional deal that it was not an original founding member of, which is different from uh, its approach to WTO. Uh, but I think there could be a leapfrogging from TPP to some other broader agreement, let's call it a free trade area of the Asia Pacific, uh, which would be a sort of TPP plus arrangement. So uh, I do think that's critical and it doesn't make sense. All of the benefits uh, that we've talked about here don't make sense unless China is a part of this, uh, of this conversation and part of these ultimately binding uh, uh, system of rules in, in the region. Um, so let me just say a word about APEC, because I really think APEC is, uh, or, or the road to, to an FTAP, or free trade area of the Asia Pacific, runs through APEC. It is the APEC vision for, uh, for free trade and investment in the region as of 2006 or 7 when it was, when it was endorsed by the leaders. Um, and uh, interestingly, this year China, uh, as I think um, Dr. Zhang mentioned, um, has uh, revived the idea of an FTAP uh, as something very concrete and actionable that we should be moving towards. Uh, and uh, I think that that is, uh, shows how um, APEC is a very important part of this story, often underappreciated, as I said in an event last week, uh, for those of you who are of a certain age and American, uh, you'll know when I say that APEC is kind of the Rodney Dangerfield of, of uh, American foreign policy. It doesn't get much respect, but it's very important because this non-binding consensual approach to, uh, to well, removing the kind of underbrush of, of impediments to trade and investment is, first of all, very important. And it serves, APEC serves as an incubator for some really good ideas in passing. I think it was uh, Dr. Zhang or someone mentioned the environmental goods and services uh, agreement in APEC. Uh, this was something that uh, the WTO had been arguing over for a long time, over actually over the definition of what an environmental good is. And in APEC, in our year, we said, let's forget what the definition of an environmental good is. Let's just agree that whatever an environmental good turns out to be, we will not impose tariffs higher than 5% by 2015. And we'll leave it to the next host, which was Russia. Uh, to figure out what an environmental good is, and to everyone's surprise, Russia did a great job of actually brokering an agreement on, I think, 54 or 56 
um, uh, tariff lines that would be treated as, as subject to this uh, non-binding uh, commitment. So a APEC has a useful role in advancing ideas like this. It also played an important role, as you all know, in the in information technology agreement many years ago, uh, several years, many years ago, I guess now. Um, uh, and this year, I think China has a real opportunity. Again, Dr. Zhang mentioned this about uh, promoting a conversation about global value chains. Uh, th this is really important because First of all, trade really isn't trade. It really is global value chains. Uh, you don't make things in one place, put them on a ship, and send them like cloth uh, made in a little uh, factory down a, an English lane and put it on a, a masted ship and send it to Portugal in exchange for wine anymore. You know, you, you think of an idea in one place, you procure parts from a lot of different other places, and you assemble them in, a, in a, yet another place and, and um, transfer them and, and um, uh, and, and sell them all over the world. Um, and this, in this world of global value chains, it doesn't make sense, it's, un, it's insufficient to only talk about uh, issues that occur at the border, like um, tariffs and customs procedures and other things. Those, those are necessary to talk about in trade negotiations, but they're not sufficient. You need to talk about the array of things behind the border that affect uh, uh, efficient global value chains. So, uh, so that means investment rules, intellectual property rules, the role of the state in the economy, regulation, a bunch of other things. So uh, that's what really uh, TPP is designed to get at. And I think there's an opportunity in APEC to have a conversation building on good work that APEC has already done on the, on the more the border issues, the supply chain issues at the border, uh, to have a broader conversation about uh, liberalizing global value chains. And if, if China can broker such a conversation this year and then it follows into the Philippines year next year, I think this could be a, a, a way of helping to try and bring these different tracks together. They may not fully converge. I'm a little skeptical that these things are going to actually converge. But I think some of the, the lower hanging or the lower elements of the, of the, um, of the disciplines that are being negotiated in, in TPP, for example, could be, uh, could be brought together through APEC. Uh, and so, um, and, made, and making these, in, these arrangements interoperable. So I think that's the real promise of APEC this year and, and into the Philippines year next year. Um, and then finally on US-Japan, so we are obviously critical to this conversation, um, obviously because we're the number one and number three largest economies in the world, uh, but also because we have a, a very similar approach to all the issues I just talked about. Um, I, I remember again going back to that APEC year at, some point in the middle of the year when I was at the White House and I asked somebody at USTR or the State Department to prepare a kind of matrix of where the other 20 economies were on the various initiatives that we had proposed. Um, and Japan, when you went down the list, was strongly support, strongly support, strongly support, strongly support. I mean, Japan was almost totally aligned with us on all of the things we were trying to do on the rulemaking side of the House. Um, uh, through APEC and, and through these other arrangements. So uh, I think it's very important for the U.S. and Japan to be aligned in trying to work on these issues. Unfortunately, we have some old issues, not the new rules, uh, which we uh, still have to work out. But I'm confident that we, we will, and uh, we will eventually reach agreement. And that will, as somebody said, drive a, um, a, a broader, I guess it was the congressman who said that, that uh, it will actually um, lead to a, a broader uh, TPP agreement if we can get agreement between the U.S. and Japan. Final point I'll make is just to echo something that Ishige-san said at the very end of his comments, that it's important for everyone, not just in the U.S. and Japan, but I think around the region, to take a, a strategic perspective to these issues. And to me, as an economic policy person uh, looking at the Asia Pacific, uh, uh, here I have my own Rodney Dangerfield complex because the word strategy is often thrown around, including at this institution, which has the word in its name, as a, in a, in a uh, traditional sense of, of high diplomacy and security issues. And that's, of course, what strategy uh, does center on. But in economics, there's strategy, too. And I think that, uh, that actually uh, TPP and RCEP in its own way, uh, and certainly APEC, are very much a part of the uh, economic strategic uh, engagement that the U.S. and Japan certainly uh, give to uh, Asia-Pacific regional economic integration. And I think that's the perspective we should bring to these conversations and look in terms of how these arrangements promote growth and uh, well-being for all of us.
uh, instead of just looking sort of narrowly at parochial uh, interests, which uh, unfortunately we too often do. So that's my appeal or my reaffir reaffirmation of what Ish Ishige-san said, that uh, strategic perspective is very important here. So I'll stop there. <clears throat> Thank you, Matthew. Um, we've been meeting like this with Jetro for about a decade, and these are always interesting um, zeitgeist checks. Uh, three years ago, uh, I think it was three years ago, Ishige-san, three years ago when we had this meeting, um, uh, many of the Asian participants were criticizing APEC, saying it's irrelevant, it's, you know, the Rodney Dangerfield thing. It just doesn't deserve any respect. <clears throat> um, uh, arguing that RCEP was far more important than TPP. Um, we even, um, and this was last year, took a vote of the audience, and a majority of the audience said, the question was, which will be completed first, RCEP or TPP? <clears throat> a majority of the audience said RCEP. Matthew and I got an angry email from a senior person in the administration because there was an article saying CSI experts predict <laughs> RCEP will be finished before TPP. <clears throat> um, last year, Professor Zhang made a very strong case that TPP is win-win uh, for China and with RCEP. <clears throat> I think he was not only reporting on the views in China, I think he was in the process of changing the views in China. So it's a real pleasure having him here. And overall, in terms of the strategy, there's much more convergence. Uh, every time we do this meeting, there's much more convergence. There are very while there are, in many ways, rising um, geopolitical or military challenges, uh, on the question of economic architecture, there's much more convergence of broad views. And you can see it clearly in the survey we did recently of, of elite opinion in Asia. <clears throat> but what I wanted to ask the panelists was, even with that convergence, I still cannot visualize, and maybe, maybe you can either, but try. <clears throat> um, let's assume we have a successful completion of TPP with 12 member states and a successful conclusion of RCEP. Um, how do you marry those? I assume the answer is not everybody who signed on the TPP gets to then reduce their um, uh, or, or increase their tariffs to get back to the RCEP level. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, as, as Hank Lim pointed out, um, you know maybe there needs to be some flexibility um, in how the non-TPP developing countries, including China, get into TPP. Maybe you create some new framework, APEC perhaps that uh, is used to arbitrate between the two, but could you speculate for a minute uh, on how RCEP and TPP um, coexist, converge, merge, um, if we complete them both some years down the road? Matt, you want to go first? Why don't you ask the... Okay. I, I mm -hmm. a, okay, uh, Professor Rata, and... Yeah. Uh, maybe my message wasn't clear. I, I thought I, I made my statement or my view for the, uh, uh, these two frameworks, I, I, I presented, uh, I proposed stages approach to uh, regional economic integration in East Asia or Asia Pacific. Uh, first step, first stage is to uh, join RCEP. I'm thinking about developing countries like CLM, maybe India too. So they join RCEP uh, and then uh, they s assume they uh, successfully grow economically and they can reach a level that they can accept some of the very high standards which uh, 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 TPP uh, imposes. Then they join TPP, so they coexist. Uh, you know, and the, in my view, objectives of t these two initiatives are quite different. Uh, maybe I, I like to know your view about this. Uh, RCEP, maybe the eventual goal is like to set up uh, East Asian community kind of, you know, we talked about this. Uh, whereas TPP, eventual goal is FTAP, and FTAP maybe go on to, you know, next generation WTO. So these are two different frameworks, in my view, and they coexist, and uh, can, countries can join both, or one first, and then, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, second, and, and so they can be a member of two frameworks. And that's how I look at these two. So to, 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 to get uh, this uh, precisely right, so individual countries, when they're ready to um, sign on to TPP standards, do that. There's no special exceptions made uh, to try to get everyone in from RCEP at once. Um, you basically, right. when, when a country's ready, it does what Japan or Australia or any current TPP member is doing and gets in. And there was 
have to uh, consider one thing. You know, uh, TPP, it has a open accession clause. Whereas RCEP, you have to be a, 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 a you have to be a dialogue, mem uh, dialogue partner of ASEAN, I guess, no? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, there's a, some condition uh, which you have to satisfy to join these frameworks. And for RCEP, it's more closed than TPP. And so for RCEP, I if I understand correctly, has to have a more open accession clause. Then individual countries can choose to join or not. So, but again, individual countries' choice. Uh, Professor Lim? I think I agree with Professor Urata, uh, except I want to add a few points from the uh, Southeast Asian perspective. Um, at this stage, at this stage, the ASEAN centrality is very important. Now, the ASEAN centrality should be interpreted in a very different way, but the way South, uh, uh, as it is constituted uh, officially by the ASEAN Secretary is that the uh, ASEAN take initiatives for creating the, uh, the ASEAN. Okay. Uh, secondly, also supposed to be uh, um, initiating the substance. Thirdly, uh, uh, the uh, ASEAN countries, uh, as uh, Professor Urata mentioned it, that they are dialogue partners. But the, uh, uh, the accession clause is already there. Uh, is already there uh, and uh, uh, reaffirmed by the principles and uh, negotiations as agreed by the ASEAN economic ministers in uh, 31st August uh, in Simrip, Cambodia in 2013, uh, 2012. <coughs> so um, these are very important issues that for ASEAN. Now, but uh, uh, the next stage where it goes, you know, how it would uh, uh, evolve. Uh, well, um, all ASEAN countries, and the APEC, I think, play a role in it. You know, I, I don't vision any other uh, roadmap where uh, the FTAP at this time, where the uh, all ASEAN member states and as, um, all the major uh, Asia Pacific, they are ASEAN dialogue partners. U.S. dialogue partner, Russia also ASEAN dialogue partner. Not in a whole, but actually from sectoral move into a whole dialogue partners. So uh, now another very important area, uh, point that need to be emphasized is that the, uh, the ASEAN centrality uh, in the AEC moving into, it actually is moving uh, il, uh, elevated from after ASEAN free trade area into the AEC, into the ASEP, and on from there on. So the idea of regional integration. Now regional integration, there are two different things in the uh, trade politics and trade negotiation. Trade negotiation is not so much of a, a, a life and death. Uh, that's why in the AEC, you don't, you don't, uh, in, 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 in discussing about the various, uh, uh, they the ASEAN economic blueprint, which was agreed in uh, Singapore in 2007, right from 2007, 8, 9, 10, up, right up to 2015. It is not a, uh, a tariff negotiation. It's not the traditional way of it. It is a regional integration. So. That's why the AEC, the ASEAN Economic Community, can be, can be best interpreted as a coordinated effort for domestic reform. So in a sense that trade facilitations and cooperation, and this is all, in my views, are uh, uh, the characteristics of APEC. That's why uh, I mentioned it, I think, last night, that the, uh, uh, we have to watch, monitor, and the way we... We feel that China uh, uh, will say a lot in this year APEC summit in uh, Beijing. So uh, I, I, we feel from Southeast Asia that China is going to use these uh, APEC instruments very much and how to <coughs> integrate. At this point in time, nobody knows the, uh, the, the next stage and the evolutions of moving, how to converge it and all these things. Because it's, it, it's the principle of, of, of you see the RCEP, also high principles and 
a lot of the things are similar. But it's the politics, the trade politics and trade policies are two different things. One is trade negotiation, U.S. insisting on rules and regulation, of course, transparencies, predictability, reducing costs. But the international trade has changed so much, like uh, Math mentioned. It's not only just uh, uh, exporting and importing, but it is uh, divisions of labor and trade in, trade, uh, trade in, uh, in uh, uh, trade in function. It's not trade in goods and services. Trade in function. So you have certain rules, and I have certain rules. Everybody will gain. So uh, I think that's the way. Uh, it will evolve, but it, exactly how, where it will, I think is difficult, but the way at this point in time is APEC seems to be the most likely uh, 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 platform or uh, framework to go. So on the security side, ASEAN centrality makes sense to the major states because it's a kind of neutral ground yes. uh, on which to begin to discuss uh, security issues. But on the trade side, um, it's not as obvious to me. Can you clarify, at least for me, um, there are members of APEC who are not ASEAN dialogue partners. Is that correct? Canada, Mexico, Chile? Uh, uh, well, on, on the, uh, yeah, Mexico is not, uh, I think it may be sectoral, but uh, it's not a whole dialogue partner. Uh, um, the other, Canada is a dialogue partner to ASEAN, so ex, uh, where else uh, uh, APEC members Chile is a dialogue partner, and uh, Chile and Sing uh, uh, in the TPP as well as Singapore-Chile uh, bilateral agreements. So um, I think it's not a, a big challenge. Uh, 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 mostly uh, overlaps with the APEC membership. So the structure of RCEP, the standards of TPP, uh, these are things that will have to be sorted out. Yes. Um, yes. But but probably. Um, uh, definitely cannot be sorted out until TPP is real and complete, RCEP is real and complete. Exactly. Um, so we'll have to be flexible and see as we go forward. We've had several proposals. Uh, Matt, do you want to weigh in on this again? I know you like the APEC yeah. framework for this, but... Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I, as I said in my remarks, I'm not sure that RCEP and, and TPP ever converge. Um, Again, I see Jeff Schott and other smart people who've thought about this, and I'd be interested when they ask a question if they could pronounce on this as well. But, um, you know, I think the, the, the standards and the rules are going to be sufficiently different. It's going to be very hard for them to actually just merge and converge. But I do think, so, so I think that ultimately if we're going to have a broader arrangement, whether it's FTAP or, you know, it's going to have to be FTAP plus because you've got to get the other three ASEANs who are not in APEC, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia, into the conversation. You have to get India into the conversation. Um, and so it's going to have to be something broader. But I, I think you're going to have to start over uh, with the base of these agreements and try to negotiate something at a higher standard. Now, from a U.S. perspective and probably from the perspective of anybody in TPP, uh, who's gone through the difficult domestic political process of getting this through, it's going to have to be TPP plus, so they're not going to be able or willing to negotiate down to a, a lighter uh, standards or less liberalization. So uh, that's a challenge in practice. Um, but And then meanwhile, along the way, as I said, I think if China can broker a, a conversation about uh, how we start making interoperable these arrangements, at least at the levels of where we don't for example, if you're in Malaysia and you're in TPP, RCEP, and you have third country trading partners, you don't want to have three different customs forms for those different um, participants. You want to, there's an incentive to try to come up to common approaches. That's a pretty simple example. But um, further up the chain, there, there may be things that we can do that are more interoperable and help bring these things together. Um, but full convergence seems unlikely. Uh, <clears throat> I think this is a very complicated issue. Uh, personally, I think, uh, you know, that today actually both TPP and RCEP are facing with, uh, you know, uncertainties and uh, certainties. Uh, for example, for TPP, uh, the certainty is that uh, more than 80% contents already compl complicated, uh, already com complete. The problem is that uh, the rest of 20%, most of them belonging to tough mission. And uh, TPP is touching, today is touching so a lot of issues behind the border. Uh, 
such as you know uh, IPR issues, environmental labor issues, uh, the, this type of issues for some of developing countries uh, very difficult to get solutions. Uh, even if in developed economies, also there are so a lot of problems. So I just wonder, even if some of developing economies, they can accept those high standard, those rules and regulations, the problem is that how to implement it, those rules and regulations for developing economies, I think that's a big issue. Uh, especially look at China. Uh, actually, in the past 35 years, we already have a series of reform and opening up. But uh, we have to confess that uh, today, facing with those issues behind the border, we need to do a lot of uh, you know, homeworks. We need to reform further. Uh, so for some of small economic entities uh, who are belonging to TPP, so actually there are a lot of you know, uh, doubts you know, on their ability uh, to, uh, to, to implement it, those high standard uh, set by TPP. Uh, regarding RCEP, uh, I think that for some of developing economies in the region, actually, especially for China and uh, Indonesia, uh, India, we feel that uh, quite uh, comfortable, you know, to join this type of negotiation compared with TPP, because you know TPP is more comfortable for developed uh, economies. Uh, the problem is that for RCEP now. Uh, I think that the most urgent thing is that uh, there is no negotiation template. There is no you know, negotiation framework. And the four rounds of negotiation, the progress is quite slow. Uh, so I deeply doubt that uh, if by the end of 2015, uh, RCEP can make you know, a result or consensus. So th that's a challenge. So my suggestion is that uh, maybe uh, uh, for China, uh, we actually, de indeed, we will respect uh, uh, other centrality. Uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, China, India, Japan, South Korea, and Asia, we should work together, uh, and we should produce our template uh, negotiation templates as soon as possible. Uh, that's most urgent. In the future, how to make them merge, uh, be, be, uh, make them be, uh, be merged? I, I think that uh, maybe it will take time. Uh, just uh, like my, I mentioned, uh, the possible you know, scenarios in the future. Because TPP will have a, you know, a series of rules and regulations, also RCEP will produce a lot. Uh, so faced with this type of situation, one possibility is that maybe TPP and RCEP teams, they can work together to discuss uh, in order to produce a new set of uh, rules or regulations. Maybe that's uh, the, the, the way. On the other hand, uh, you know, just like uh, Ulata mentioned, uh, some of uh, entity, economic entities, they can join TPP. That's also possible. But another, you know, I mentioned the three possible uh, approaches, but I think that maybe fourth possible, maybe we can, you know, uh, 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 actually we can put aside, you know, TPP regulations as well as RCEP regulations, just based on those uh, bilateral and trilateral, you know, uh, simple of uh, traditional free trade agreement. And then maybe if APEC platform could be transferred, you know, to Asia Pacific uh, uh, APTAP. That's also another possible, you know, approaches. My, I mean, uh, very briefly, in the future, you know, the study on roadmap of APTAP is very important and very critical. I hope that uh, all APEC economic entities uh, can sit together and to explore the possible you know, merge approaches. Well, thank you. It's, it's, uh, it's complicated but exciting, but first we have to figure out the tariff on Japanese pork imports. <laughs> so uh, one thing at a time. Let me open it up uh, for... Yeah, sure, Hank. And then we'll take questions. Yeah. Uh, 
special and uh, that uh, in response to Professor Chang's uh, point, uh, it need to be clarified. Uh, I was invited to the ASEAN Economic, uh, Senior Economic Official Meeting on, in October last year when Brunei Darussalam was the uh, chair of ASEAN uh, Summit. Now, uh, special differential treatment doesn't mean that you lower the quality, the high standards and all these things. It is just giving more time for them to implement it, agree and implement it, it's giving more uh, time. So it's uh, plucking out all the low hanging trees first, and then the fruits, and then later on up in the higher uh, fruits. So uh, it, this must be clearly understood. So uh, special differential treatment, it, uh, you know, because Professor Chang is difficult to implement, for example, for Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam would agree that uh, high standards in RCEP and all this, but giving more allowance of time. Okay, so that would reduce the distortions in, in trade uh, integrations. The second point is that the RCEP, because a lot of uh, uh, apprehensions that maybe uh, the uh, ASEAN, uh, the RCEP will not be able to finish. So this is how we suggest, uh, uh, and is being duly considered by the ASEAN Senior Economic Official, SEOM, S-E-O-M. Uh, now, uh, Myanmar is the uh, chair. They have also quite a number of SEOM meetings already in Myanmar as well as in, uh, in Malaysia and Vietnam. Uh, with, uh, there is a possibility that it based on installment, pro uh, installment uh, stages in the sense that by 2015, uh, good sector all will be completed. But service sectors and investment sector will be the second phase. So it means, but you must agree to pay a deposit first. So the deposit is in the goods sector. So service sector, it means installment. So every, but installment in a sense that you agree the principle, but the delivery and the uh, actual agreement all will come later. The second, po the, the second point is that the, uh, uh, you must also agree on the schedules. It may not necessarily be uh, uh, one single undertaking that from beginning to the end, which ASEAN does not agree. And the ASEP is not a single under undertaking, but in TPP is a single undertaking. So not necessarily a single undertaking, but it must have a schedule. If you pay installment, you go, you borrow money from the bank, how much you put the initial first and then second installment and all these things. So it's being seriously considered in us. So <clears throat> I personally, uh, uh, hopeful that RCEP by 2015 would agree. Quite a lot of things may not be the full things, but good sector will be completed. Installments on service investment and uh, freer capital flow will come into it. So now the issue is that the uh, how to cre uh, how to agree on the schedules. So <clears throat> uh, when Myanmar now is uh, chairing the uh, ASEAN, so the the, the, the SIOM meeting, the senior economic official meetings, which is uh, the technical working groups to put up proposal to the ASEAN economic ministers on RCEP, on AEC. So it seems to be that the, uh, uh, that the, uh, uh, the RCEP <coughs> uh, recommendations that being discussed when in the uh, Bandai Sri ones in October, when, uh, which I was invited to to give some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, suggestions based from the area studies on the uh, RCEP. So uh, there is such a possibility that the RCEP would be concluded along this line. One, they would agree on goods, service sector, all based on installment. Thirdly, based on the schedules uh, uh, and the working groups on competition policy, intellectual property rights, SPS, and TBD, the technical value to trade. Okay. Thanks very much, Sherm Katz, Center for Study of the Presidency. This is a friendly question, Dr. Lim, about RCEP. You said, at, because I believe in it, and I think many in this room do, uh, you said at one point that, the, that ASEAN is not providing the substantive initiative for the negotiations. And you also suggested that perhaps some of the non-ASEAN members could take that initiative. Let me suggest a third possibility which gets to some sort of political, cultural, and economic things you may be able to enlighten us on. And that is 
that the ASEAN members themselves should be taking the initiative. Uh, for example, you, you have such a very basic thing as whether it's positive list or negative list. Uh, in Geneva at the WTO, for example, we would generally imagine that it would not be the secretary, director general who'd be taking the initiative on that, but some of the members of the WTO themselves. So what I'm trying to tease out is your evaluation of the readiness of the ASEAN members to really get going on uh, the business of uh, RCEP. Uh. Well, a few things. Uh, a few things. Uh, thank you for your uh, questions. Um, Indonesia is uh, is moving toward more of uh, inward looking. So Indonesia is by far the largest ASEAN member states. Uh, is the uh, Indonesia is uh, not so not so open and uh, outward looking. So uh, a, a month from today, uh, on the 9th of uh, uh, July, there will be presidential election. There are two candidates, presidential candidates. One is the governor of Jakarta, the, uh, Joko Widodo, and the other one is general, uh, former uh, army generals, the <coughs> Prabowo Subianto. Both are nationalists. Okay, so Indonesia is moving toward inward looking. So it's a bit difficult. Singapore has uh, ideas uh, 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 in, about the negative list instead of the positive list on, uh, on moving toward the ASEP uh, further in substantive. But it's, uh, as I understand it, uh, this is again, it's, uh, it's a private views, uh, that uh, it, uh, ASEAN uh, is very difficult for Singapore to, to, to move uh, to move the substantive uh, uh, discussion, unless it used to be Thailand and uh, uh, pass it on to Thailand and Thailand carry the balls. But Thailand now is in turmoil. It's, it's, uh, government is not in action, so under military uh, uh, control. So it's difficult to find a partner where it is part. Malaysia is, <coughs> uh, is going to be the ASEAN chair next year, uh, but you have to wait until next year. This year is Myanmar. So again, Myanmar is not that ready to uh, undertake this role. So you have to cooperate. Uh, the way it is arranged in ASEAN is that you have to work closely with the ASEAN chair, who is, the, who is going to organize the ASEAN summit, ASEAN minister meeting, and senior economic officials. So, uh, so uh, in fact, actually, I think uh, Professor Urata and myself, and Professor Peter Drysdales, and Professor Chang Yun Ling from China all, We'll meet in Singapore on the 20th, this uh, uh, next uh, uh, 20th June, uh, on the sidelines of the uh, RCEP meeting in Singapore on Friday, uh, to uh, to discuss all these initiatives, how initiatives, uh, how non-ASEAN members all can uh, can promote the substantive issues and push forward the RCEP. So, uh, so there are quite numbers of things are being. It, are being explored, and I think China, uh, Japan, and uh, Korea also seems to be giving some encouragement. And Australia is taking the lead in, in moving along the, your suggestion. Yes, right here in the middle. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Vikram Nehru. I'm from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And thank you uh, all for your excellent uh, discussion. Uh, Michael, you raised on now on two occasions the whole issue of security. Um, and it seems to me that there are these two parallel tracks going on. The first is increased economic integration, and the second is increased dissonance on security issues in the region. And this divergence between these two tracks, uh, potentially, it's, is really unsustainable. So the question that I have to the panel and to the lone discussant is um, to what extent will the security questions impact the economic integration issues, both RCEP and TPP. Will the impact be different for these two tracks? And to what extent is increased economic integration good security strategy? And to what extent could it potentially actually have an impact? Uh, can increased integration actually make countries more vulnerable to security, uh, to security trends in the region? 
Thank you very much. I think one, uh, one impact is the trade negotiation that no one's really, I, I think no one has mentioned, which is the you know, China, Japan, Korea trilateral, which is in abeyance in large part because of these political and security challenges. Um, but let me open the floor and see other examples. Uh, yes, uh, China, Japan, Korea, so-called CJK, FTA negotiations. Uh, as I understand it, they are moving forward regardless of uh, our political problem with uh, China, uh, our pro you know, political problem with Korea. So uh, as far as negotiations are concerned, they don't be, uh, it, uh, so far, they haven't been affected by political problems. And uh, uh, the relationship between security issues and economic issues, uh, uh, of course, if you, I, I like to see more economic uh, integration or, or interaction between two countries, say Japan and China, will lead to a better security rela relationship. Uh, but I don't know, that, that's what I hope. And uh, 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 as I understand it, the closer they get together, it makes more damaging if they get into trouble. So it, it, I, I hope that that, that kind of uh, way of looking at the relationship is uh, 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 correct. And on the other, at the same time, uh, political tensions lead to or discourages economic relationship. And here, uh, what is interesting is that the uh, number of Japanese tourists to Korea and China has been declining, as far as I understand it, whereas uh, tourists coming from China and Jap uh, Korea to Japan, uh, for whatever reason, are increasing. Uh, so Japanese, I guess, tourists are more, much more affected by political relations than Chinese or Koreans. And uh, that's uh, just a fact that I understand correctly. But again, what I'm trying to say is that uh, 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 more problems in political or security relations can lead to uh, uh, declining the relationship in economic matters. And that's why we, we don't want to see any political uh, security conflicts between, say, Japan and other countries. Thank you. Uh, actually, from an uh, economic aspect, uh, you can find that uh, uh, the trend is convergence uh, due to uh, global, global economic globalization and the regional economic integration. Uh, but if you look at the political aspect, definitely <coughs> security issues uh, will be another direction. That is uh, divergence. So I, I think that, uh, I, I like to remind you that uh, every, even if bilateral FTA uh, or multilateral uh, FTA, that's not a pure economic issues, but also will be uh, Im impact, you know, by political issues, diplomatic issues. So uh, personally, I, I hope that uh, CJK FTA could be in progress. Uh, that FTA cannot be, you know, uh, disturbed by, uh, by political re reasons. Uh, but in fact, I, I think that maybe the progress uh, also, you know, will be, you know, impact uh, uh, to some extent. But how to evaluate, uh, I, I think it's not easy. Uh, but generally speaking, I think that uh, in this region, from mid, uh, medium and long run, CJK FTA is a very critical trilateral FTA for East Asia economic integration, as well as for Asia Pacific economic integration. Thank you. Um, just, just a word. So, um, I think the CJK example is is um, is clearly one where there, the security issues are having an impact on the policy initiative um, in, in that agreement. I think on the two main tracks, there isn't much evidence that the security issues are slowing down the economic policy uh, impetus to integration. Uh, nor is there much evidence that it's speeding it up, which is another possible 
uh, outcome in the sense that if, if it were so true, I mean, to be a little oversimplified, but that the, the TPP members wanted to get this done somehow to, uh, uh, to um, establish more solidarity in the face of, um, of, of some of the challenges uh, that, that some of the members are facing from, uh, from China, then, uh, you know, it's, it's not clear to me why we haven't reached agreement yet. I mean, we're obviously still negotiating over, over some really hard economic issues, and that's what I think is slowing it down, not the, not the political or security issues, and nor is it speeding it up in, in particular. I do think on the ground, though, that, you know, clearly Japanese investment in China, you know, has the marginal, you know, flow of investment has, has slowed pretty dramatically, and uh, so I think uh, it, has, it is having an impact on integration at that level. But as a policy matter, I don't see much evidence uh, either direction other than uh, CG, CJK, which is sort of a special situation. We're also, I, th I think, asking about the macro sort of long-term impact of these two trends. And um, putting on the historian's hat for a moment, um, there are historians who uh, argue that, for example, it was convergence with the gold standard um, in 1931, uh, and then the collapse of the British pound that um, cause displacement and um, uh, militarism in Japan. So it wasn't because there was convergence, but convergence created an expectation and uh, winners and losers in the economy, and then it was exacerbated when, uh, when the global economy hit a crisis. Or even before World War I, there are historians who argue that, in fact, it was economic interdependence that weakened British power, that, that, that made uh, deterrence and maintenance of a balance of power harder, um, that somehow it was economic interdeterrence that sowed the seeds. Um, possibly, possibly, but I would still bet on um, uh, these economic uh, integration efforts reinforcing peace and stability, in part because legitimacy for every regime and country other than North Korea, um, including now Myanmar, depends heavily on economic performance, um, also because the democratization um, examples in Asia are all, are all about growing middle classes. Um, and, uh, and so uh, I think we're right to bet on <laughs> economic interdependence and these economic frameworks having a positive impact, but you know, nothing is guaranteed. Uh, nothing is guaranteed in life. In 1928, Thomas Lamont, the head of uh, J.P. Morgan, gave a speech uh, at the time, a very famous speech saying, war with Japan is absolutely impossible because of the economic uh, uh, ties between the countries. So you can't bet 100% on it, but I think it's a good trend line overall. Yeah. Can answer. Uh, yes, over here. Uh, Jeff Schott. Oh, now, now we're in, in trouble, a real economist. Uh, Jeff Schott with the Peterson Institute. Uh, I think uh, the combined comments of the panelists have given us some good insights on the question of convergence. Uh, and unfortunately, Mr. Lim, I think your arguments have shown why RCEP is going to be on a very slow track. In fact, everything you've said has indicated that. But it also has indicated a reluctance to move quickly on policy reform uh, in many areas of uh, uh, economic interchange. Uh, you, you mentioned the focus on goods and pushing off decisions on services and other, other areas. If you want to look where convergence is taking place already, look at the countries that are looking at economic integration arrangements as a means of complementing domestic reform. China is in the forefront of that. Korea has done that for the past decade because through Chorus and through its FTAs with, uh, uh, with Europe and is now engaged in a very important negotiation with China. Japan is doing that, albeit grudgingly, in the context of uh, the TPP negotiations. Those are the countries that are setting really the standard for economic integration in the region and are providing really the impetus for other countries to consider accelerating domestic reform. And I think that's why you're seeing so many countries looking into or studying very closely the possibility of engaging with TPP. Uh, already seven of the 16 RCEP countries are in TPP, and four others are studying it uh, at various stages given the political cycles in their, in their country. 
So I, I, I think I, I'm more in line with what Matt and what Professor Arata have said. RCEP is really in, uh, a complementary uh, uh, initiative that is almost a preparatory school uh, for deeper integration. Uh, and that it's unlikely that there'll be a convergence of the RCEP and the TPP, uh, and yet th there will be a need to use the cooperation uh, of countries, and this is one of the things China is considering this, uh, this year in APEC, uh, to help advance and accelerate uh, the economic development so that there is inclusive growth throughout the region. Uh, but it seems to me that TPP will be the standard, and the, and the challenge for TPP countries is uh, how do you ensure uh, a smooth transition so that you can bring in uh, more and more countries in the coming years, and you can then deal with the uh, non-TPP members in a way that encourages their, their uh, readiness uh, in the future. I think that's the challenge that APEC countries have this year. Uh, before I respond to that, uh, first on the securities and uh, things uh, while ASEAN. Uh, in addition to the ASEAN economic community, actually we have another two pillars. One is the ASEAN social cultural community, and the other one is uh, uh, ASEAN political security communities. So the three must go together. Second point is also even though the ASEAN economic community uh, sometimes is misleading means no because you compare to us uh, European uh, community. But <clears throat> ASEAN, so that's why uh, conflicts uh, in Southeast Asia uh, uh, tend to be um, under control in a sense that they, <clears throat> they would like to have a sense of community, even though with small C, not the big C like in the European case. So security is very much in the minds of many ASEAN policy makers. Uh, the second point is uh, on the South China Sea, the um, spread the islands. As you know, uh, 2002, uh, Indonesia initiated this uh, uh, DOC, Declarations of content Contending Parties in the South China Sea. But it is a uh, voluntary non-binding. China also agree. Uh, but uh, it's not good enough. You must have some commitment. So because security issues, uh, the ASEAN-China FTA, uh, which comes, uh, came into full operation in 2010, but it's not good enough, okay? Although ASEAN's are, uh, Asian peoples are more pragmatic, more materialistic than Europeans or others. Uh, economic benefits, tangibles, all are very important. Although uh, the, the impulse of war, impulse of uh, resolving conflict through armed struggles and all these things is still there, but you must understand also the socio-cultural characteristics that material tangible benefits uh, are very, very important. So as a result of it now, we're moving into the COC, Code of Conduct. And China was very reluctant at first, but <clears throat> through ASEAN centrality and all these things, so China has agreed. In Myanmar on, in May, the first ASEAN summit, uh, China has agreed to proceed. On, from DOC to COC. So in a sense, there is, you need a framework in addition of economic interaction, economic cooperation, economic integrations. You need a framework whereby security, peace, and, 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 and uh, possible conflict can be not to avoid, but can be minimized and can be managed. But it, it, it is not happening in Northeast Asia. Uh, partly is because they are big powers and secondly, is also <clears throat> ASEAN reach beyond uh, to Northeast Asia. But at least in Southeast Asia, that possibility framework has been uh, uh, put, in, uh, put in place and being considered and initiated by ASEAN countries. And that is the issue of the economic corporations uh, uh, and integration with the security framework. There are quite a lot of contending uh, uh, disputes between Indonesia and Malaysia on Simbadan, on Sigitan, and all this. They resolve it. 
uh, uh, just last week, Indonesia and Philippines also <coughs> agreed on the disputed islands. Uh, uh, Singapore and Malaysia on the, uh, 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 the Raffles Lighthouse. Uh, it's very close to Malaysia, but uh, for over 120 years under the Singapore Lighthouse Raffles and all this. And the International Court of Justice has agreed to, uh, uh, they say it belongs to Singapore. And Malaysia agree, accept it. So in Southeast Asia, it seems to be there is a framework, although it is still fragile and tentative, but uh, uh, it is uh, uh, much better than in Northeast Asia. So at least that's the issue uh, 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 more manageable. Um, we're going to break now for lunch. Lunch is back over there. If you could um, grab your lunch, bring back, we'll hear from Wendy Cutler from USTR, and let's thank the panel for a very uh, uh, excellent discussion.